Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Grand Rounds. It's my pleasure today to introduce Dr. Paul Crane, one of our own UW faculty. So after graduating from Williams College, Dr. Crane came to the University of Washington, where he attended our School of Medicine and completed an internship in internal medicine before moving on to Missouri for a residency in primary care at Washington University. Also fellowship training in health behavior research, also at WashU. He evidently decided that he preferred the reverse order of words in his university title, and he returned to the University of Washington for an NRSA fellowship in general internal medicine, as well as a master's degree in public health. Dr. Crane is a professor in the Department of Internal Medicine at UW, an adjunct professor in the Department of Health Services, um, and affiliate faculty at the Group Health Research Institute. Dr. Crane's focus of research is on psychometrics and measurement theory, as well as Alzheimer's disease and cognitive functioning, uh, with an impressive number of active grants, including research into the genetic architecture of memory and executive functioning in Alzheimer's disease, cardiovascular and pharmacologic risk factors for the development of Alzheimer's disease, um, and also in characterizing the neuropathology of chronic traumatic brain injuries. He has received the new Investigator Award from the International Society of Quality of Life Research. And nationally, Dr. Crane is a grant reviewer for the Alzheimer's Association Research Awards and serves on the editorial board for the Journal of the American Geriatric Society. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Paul Crane to speak on some updates in Alzheimer's research. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. And it's a great pleasure and an honor to be here today. So there's about 5.4 million Americans who have Alzheimer's disease in 2016. 5.2 million of these are age 65 and over, and about 200,000 are under the age of 65. It's an extremely expensive condition, $236 billion estimated in the United States this year, and it's projected to be between $1 and $1.3 trillion in the United States by the middle of this century. And this is from the Alzheimer's Association Facts and Figures uh, book, which they do each year. It's really an excellent resource for finding out information, factual information about Alzheimer's disease. This is projections of the age distribution of Alzheimer's disease cases by the middle of, the, uh, of this century in the United States, with 4.7 million today, in 2010 rather, and 13.8 million people by 2050. And you can see that it's especially in the older age groups that we're expected to see many more cases of Alzheimer's today disease. This is gonna be sort of my roadmap for this talk where I'm gonna talk about um, Alzheimer's research milestones and integrate some of my own work and work that I've been involved with within this sort of framework. It, Alzheimer described a woman named Auguste D in 1906. She was 51, she had dementia, she had hallucinations, she died, came to autopsy, and he did some new silver staining techniques on her brain at autopsy and found that she had plaques and neurofibrillary tangles. And he presented this at a meeting in 1906, wrote it up in 1907. <laughs> Kreplin included it in his uh, textbook in, 20, in 1910 and called it Alzheimer's disease. And Kreplin said it didn't make any sense to call senile dementia, the old age form of this, a disease since pathological processes of old age were considered to be normal. Dementia at younger ages, even with the same brain pathology, were a disease. And the literature maintained this distinction between Alzheimer's disease as a young onset, rare condition, distinct from senile dementia for many decades. And yes, we fast forward to 1960s. And, the, and at that time, Blessed Tomlinson and Roth published a series of really important papers where they looked at people who had died and come to autopsy who had been old at the time they had dementia and found a correlation between neuritic plaques and the extent of cognitive impairment among the older people with dementia. And they thought that maybe senile dementia was Alzheimer's disease. And this was picked up by Katzman in the late 1970s, who suggested that we should stop and drop the distinction between Alzheimer's disease and senile dementia, and wrote a very important editorial in 1976, sponsored a workshop in 1978, and the outcome of all of this was a consensus that Alzheimer's disease and senile dementia were one unified thing that wasn't part of normal aging, but rather that this was a disease. And the National Institute on Aging picked up on this in a big way. So there were many other institutes that had diseases like the Cancer Institute. Aging didn't really have a disease and it latched onto the idea that Alzheimer's disease was its reason to be. And it's been part of the DNA of the NIA since its founding. 
A really important piece of work was in 1984, a big consensus of many experts in the field came up with an operational definition of clinical Alzheimer's disease. And to be in this field, you have to practice NINCDS, ADRDA, and it has to roll off the tongue that fast. It's used ubiquitously across studies with a whole lot of study designs, and it's really the only thing that is in common across all these studies. And that's gonna to prove to be important, as I'll show you later. So that takes us all the way halfway up here with the McCann study and the McCann definition of operationally defining Alzheimer's disease. And it's gonna lead us to launch into the ACT study. So that stands for Adult Changes in Thought, and it's had continuous funding from the National Sun Aging. It began in the late 1980s with Eric Larson, um, and then Bud Kukul, Gerald Van Bell, Andrea LaCroix, and many others participated in, in establishing an Alzheimer's disease patient registry. And that was the name of the RFA. It was modeled on cancer registries. And the idea um, proved to not be a very good one for Alzheimer's disease epidemiology, in part because Alzheimer's cases really can't remember what their exposures were. So in 1994, there was an important design change where it became a prospective cohort study where we enrolled people who were not demented. They were all over age 65. They were not in a nursing home. And other than that, they were just randomly selected from people who were members of group health. And we followed these people over time to identify incident cases of dementia using a DSM-4 criteria and Alzheimer's disease do, using that McCann definition we talked about. And it's a very large study. We've had more than 5,400 participants to date, 1,100 incident cases of dementia, 850 incident cases of Alzheimer's disease, and we've had consistent NIA funding throughout. And currently I have the privilege of serving with Dr. Larson as the PI of the study. We ask for autopsy consent, and it's humbling that 25 to 30% of the people in our study who are randomly selected group health members who volunteered to be in a longitudinal study agree to donate their brain to science on their death. And we've completed more than 640 autopsies to date. We have another 800 participants with active autopsy consents and perform 40 to 60 autopsies per year and perform an extensive standardized workup on these people. I'm not a neuropathologist and I'm not gonna be talking to you much about the details of brain pathology today. It's fascinating and I've learned a tremendous amount. Our strategy for ACT throughout has been to leverage the extensive strengths from working with group health. They have extensive clinical and administrative data every prescription fill since 1977, millions of fills, every clinical lab since 1988, many, 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 many laboratory tests. And this has enabled us to perform lots of risk factor analyses, leveraging again, the same operational definition of Alzheimer's disease. And this is just a selected slew of some of these papers looking at medications, vascular risk factors, and other factors. I picked one of my favorites, which is glucose. This is a paper I had the privilege to lead in the New England Journal on glucose levels and risk of dementia. And this is sort of the bottom line. On the left-hand side is for people without diabetes, we were able to use more than 20 glucose measures per person in our cohort to come up with a time-varying estimate of glucose exposure over the preceding five years, integrating both glucose and hemoglobin A1C measures. And here we show an accelerated and increasing risk of dementia with each higher level of blood sugar well within the normal range between 90 and 120. And then the other uh, figure on the right shows for people with diabetes, uh, and there too it shows an increasing risk of dementia with higher levels of blood sugar among people with diagnosed and treated diabetes. And it looks like a, a, a threshold of about 160, so if you can keep your average blood sugar below 160, that might be a good idea if you have type 2 diabetes. This is an important study from our group um, on the ecology of the aging human brain. So this is some neuropath findings after I told you I wouldn't present any. Um, in blue here is Alzheimer's disease, the green is Lewy body disease, and the red is micro infarcts, a very small microscopic infarct that you can see only under the microscope. What you're looking at here is the people who died without a diagnosis of dementia and furthermore, within that group, this is the 80% of people in the top four-fifths of our cognitive score. These people really weren't close to having dementia at the time they died. And this is all 116 or 17 of those at the time this paper was analyzed, published in 2011. And you see there's almost nobody who dies in the Seattle area, who's a member of Group Health and a member of our study, who doesn't have any neuropathology in their brain. Almost everybody accumulates neuropathology during their life. It's a critically important question of how do you differentiate 
the people who do develop dementia and the people who don't. So Josh Sonnen, the first author of this paper, developed a score that combined various neuropathology elements. And you see that for every neuropathology score, there's a higher proportion of people who have dementia than people who don't. But nevertheless, there is no threshold where you can say, ah, here there's clearly a line where we can delineate the people who will have dementia during life and the people who won't. So I'm going to branch off now and talk about the genetics of early onset Alzheimer's disease, another series of really important papers. The first of these is from Allison Goat and her colleagues in 1991. And here they're talking about amyloid precursor protein. And this is from Nature in that year. And they, they suggest that beta amyloid peptide deposition is the central event in the pathogenesis of the disorder and pointed out that APP on chromosome 21, that's also where trisomy 21 and Down syndrome happens. And almost everybody with Down syndrome, if they live long enough, develops something that looks a lot like and is called Alzheimer's disease. And so they suggest that it's causal. And that was from 1991. Four years later, there's two other discoveries of presenilin genes. The second one on presenilin 2, the Levy Lahad paper, that's Jerry Schellenberg's work from here in Seattle at the VA at the time. So very important discoveries of, of rare early onset Alzheimer's disease uh, where what we're finding is some, some genes involved with amyloid processing. And anyone who knows me will know I'm not a molecular anything. This is a picture from a journal um, article on APP here sticking on the, on the surface. And it's got a bunch of presenilins that are acting to hold it onto the membrane. And there's a bunch of cleavage sites, there's an alpha cleavage site, a beta cleavage site, and two gamma cleavage sites. And those, those secretases and where they cleave the APP molecule determines if you get a longer, stickier, or a shorter, less stickier, maybe it's vice versa. Anyway, one of them's sticky and it gloms on all together and makes a big stream of amyloid that's all sticking together rather than being processed in a normal fashion and not glomming up the works. This is, in a nutshell, my understanding, brief as it is, of the amyloid hypothesis, the amyloid cascade hypothesis that's supposedly at the center of Alzheimer's disease. So then the next thing that happens in my little history thing is amyloid imaging. So this is work from 2004. Prior to this work, in order to diagnose amyloid in a living person, you couldn't do it. It had to be an autopsy. And this was fascinating because now they're taking these stains that were developed in the pathology lab and modifying them so that you could inject them into a living person. I was in the audience in Stockholm when this picture was shown, and I was a general internist, I still am, a general internist, and I don't read PET scans. And I'm sitting in the back. Even I could tell the difference between this and this, right? So it looked amazing. I thought we'd have the answer, that this was the end, because we could diagnose this condition in living people who would be able to get up and leave, and we'd be able to figure everything out at that point. Hasn't been quite that easy. So the next thing is the Jack model. I've seen this slide in probably 100, 150 talks. This is an important paper from Cliff Jack at the Mayo Clinic from 2010. And he's showing us here that the hypothesis is that amyloid precedes everything else. Amyloid is the first thing to go. Then the next blue line here is tau mediated neural dysfunction, and then brain structure in green and then memory, and then finally clinical function, that all of this stuff is preceding the clinical onset of dementia. This has been a highly influential model. It's still a model. It has some support in early onset Alzheimer's disease. This is a paper from 2012 by Bateman and colleagues in the New England Journal on the Diane study, dominantly inherited Alzheimer's disease. I think this is one of the victories of the internet era, is that we can now enroll people from far, far, far away who have a rare condition and collect really excellent data from them and do really amazing things. One of the things that they I wanted to point out that the ages that they we're talking about here are truly young. So not everybody here has dementia. They all have family histories of, and we know who has a, a carrier of one of these inherited alleles and who doesn't. But these are young people at the time that they were in this study. And this is showing pretty much the Jack model, that indeed if we were to take the family onset of um, of dementia, of Alzheimer's disease at time zero, and we're measuring stuff in the pre-dementia phase in these people, we're able to do some magic with the math and suggest indeed that they, we are able to see a bunch of stuff going on before dementia and before Alzheimer's onset. 
So the Dubois paper, I think, is a really critical one and is reflecting a change in what's going on. So this is a paper from Lancet Neurology in 24 about research diagnostic criteria for Alzheimer's disease. And IWG is the international working group. So this is the second round of this international working group thinking about what is this condition, Alzheimer's disease. And the first issue they addressed is typical Alzheimer's disease. And it's a radical change. They define it now as amyloid disease, that Alzheimer's is amyloid. You have to have evidence of amyloid abnormalities either from an amyloid scan, $5,200 at Harborview, or from a CSF evaluation, which is invasive, that otherwise you cannot diagnose Alzheimer's disease. And they divorce Alzheimer's disease from dementia. They talk about an asymptomatic stage of Alzheimer's disease for people with what they call cerebral amyloidosis, and I'm fine with that, with that phrase, who don't have dementia. And I just bring back Josh's slide from the ecology of the aging brain. So do, is it that really the case that all but nine people, and if you look, almost all of these people have some blue. There's like one, two, three little red lines that go all the way down to the x-axis. And then there's the nine people who had nothing. So there's 12 people out of our 118 in the top four-fifths of our decedents. Is it really the case that all of these people have pre-morbid, or what did they call it? They call it asymptomatic stage Alzheimer's disease, it doesn't make sense to me. Um, or maybe Alzheimer's disease just isn't that bad and that's not what we usually think of. And the people who wrote the, the Dubois paper, they're very careful about this and they're actually quite appropriately reticent about making big, big distinctions here and they argue that there's age-related limitations, that these concepts don't work very well in the oldest group, and they define that as age over 85 years. And they point out that CSF biomarkers, MRI doesn't work so well in old people, that they have many other systemic comorbidities and general health problems. It's a general internal medicine complexity kind of problem in older people. And they suggest maybe we should refine things and separate young people from oldest old. And this is again from that facts and figures thing to remind us that the people we're talking about in that oldest old group is the blue part of this uh, graph, 37% of the population. So an awful lot of people are not included in this. And I would argue that the same issues are tremendously relevant in that dark purple group of 75 to 85 year olds, which is another 44% of the population that these criteria really best apply, really best apply to the gray group and perhaps the orange group. So there's been a lot of work on the genetics of late onset Alzheimer's disease and it revisits the Kreplin, the Katzman, the fundamental questions from the beginnings of the field to address the question of whether early onset and late onset Alzheimer's disease are the same thing. And the modern genetics revolution, I think, provides really important new tools to address this question. This is a paper from Iceland, a really important paper in Nature in 2012 that looked at APP. So APP was the one on chromosome 21, Down syndrome, that whole story. And so people have looked very carefully at the early onset Alzheimer's disease in late onset populations to try to find anything. And sure enough, they found what they thought was a protective variant, but it was pretty rare. So rare that when we look for it in the United States, uh, it happens to be on the exome variant array, the exome chip, this particular variant. And so we typed it in many people across the United States, and we found it in two people. One person who was, had Alzheimer's disease was Russian ancestry and was, uh, had the onset of disease at age 89, and the other person was 82 and was cognitively normal and intact, and that person had been born in Iceland. How cool is that? And the last sentence here is both were from the ACT study based in Seattle, Washington. So this is a very rare variant and you can't conclude much statistically with two people, right? You really can't. So this title is right. It's a rare variant. We don't know anything more than that it's really rare. So the McCann definition that we talked about that NIN, CDS, ADRDA criteria has proven to be really important because every study collects the data the same way. They all diagnose Alzheimer's disease the same way. And it's permitted these uh, big network studies uh, with genome-wide association studies. And the first of these is by Nye et al. in 2011 that I wrote with a few of my colleagues. <laughs> and this is essentially, this is 15, 20 different studies of Alzheimer's disease in the United States. Each of these people followed over many time, lots of money invested in getting these phenotypes, not to mention the genetic data. And this, I 
I was in the audience in Hawaii when these were presented and it was very helpful. So one of the brilliant things Eric did was to name the ACT study ACT. It's not Alzheimer's disease anything, it's adult changes in thought. So the second letter is C, so alphabetically we come first. So ACT is at the top of all of these lists. Very important scientific <laughs> principle. So these forest plots show that the signals for these newly discovered loci are all just about the same. And I slept so much better after this. We had so many papers where we didn't conclude the same thing that others had in the literature. We can't confirm this exciting new finding because we're more careful, we think, or because we're just doing something crazy and different. We're not doing anything crazy and different, right? Our Alzheimer's disease diagnoses are working just the same way at the genetic level as everybody else's, which is very reassuring. And we didn't mislabel our tubes or have any other practical problems. This to me was very nice validation that whatever we're doing is the same as everybody else in the country. We were able to get the individual level genotype data from each of these studies and combine them. And there's a lot of information on this slide that I'm just gonna explain a little bit of. The blue at the top is the studies that used flavor one of genotyping chip. The red is flavor two. The purple confusingly used some of flavor one and some of flavor two chips. There were 17,000 SNPs in common on the two chips after we did LD, whatever, whatever. Anyway, we were able to use all of these data to get a nice rectangular data set of unrelated people so that people didn't need to use meta-analyses to analyze these data. They could just do one analysis on our smaller subset of carefully curated data that was a nice uh, contribution to the field. And that was led by my colleague, Joey Mukherjee, um, over at Harborview. And one of the things we did that with that is to look at heritability. And this is with a group at um, Brigham Young University where we were able to use a GCTA software and look at the amount of variance in that Alzheimer's disease phenotype that's explained by genetic variants on each of the chromosomes. And APOE is on chromosome 19, that's the one that's huge and sticking up there, but that's the pattern across the other chromosomes. And I superimpose on here the three early onset Alzheimer's disease. There's really nothing going on on chromosome 21 and nothing at all on chromosome 14. And the chromosome one signal, which is where pre 2 is, the parts of the chromosome that are involved with that signal are not where pre 2 is. There's no relationship between the early onset Alzheimer's disease genes and GWAS findings for Alzheimer's disease. And we subsequently published a different paper with a later uh, reference build. I guess this was this year where we found that 53% of the phenotypic variants in Alzheimer's disease seems to be explained by genes. So there's about half and half that are heritable versus environmental exposures. This is the now lumping together the Alzheimer's Genetics Consortium with three other consortia with a few other of my colleagues. And this is really everybody in the world now who's doing Alzheimer's disease research. And this is 74,000 people in this GWAS. And this is the Manhattan plot that shows the, the specific genes that are sticking up and saying, hey, I might be relevant here. And again, APP not, not related, pre one pre and 2 not related to late onset Alzheimer's disease. Can you predict risk at the individual level using these genetic data? And I think this is an important answer, which is you really can't because it's a tiny, it's statistically significant, but clinically irrelevant. The reason we do genetics isn't to help Mrs. Jones or Mr. Smith directly today in clinic. It's to identify things about the underlying biology of Alzheimer's disease or whatever phenotype we're looking at even taken together, all of these SNPs are really not very individually predictive of whether you're going to develop it. And here we've got a bunch of prospective cohort studies where we're all using uh, time to event outcomes. Uh, I mentioned that there were many, many different designs in the GWAS paper. The International Genomics of Alzheimer's Project has done a very brilliant thing, which is to release the data to the world. So right now you can go to your laptop, plunk in the right things, and then you can download the IGAP summary statistics for 7 million loci, which is really cool and they've been used. One of the things that they've been used for is a network analysis from 2015 that showed immunity. And we did this same work with a very bright graduate student from Yale named Kyung Shi Lu. I met him at the, um, uh, the ENCODE users group meeting a few years ago. So ENCODE is really studying the non-coding regions of your genome. And uh, most of the hits from GWASs are in non-coding regions. Really important to understand the regulatory stuff and I won't get into it here, but it seems to me for a late life acquired disease like Alzheimer's disease or whatever we're talking about in late life in brains of old people, 
regulatory, regulatory, regulatory is going to be really, really important as opposed to coding, 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 where you get pediatric diseases. Anyway, what Qiangxi Lu did was to use functional annotation of the non-coding genome and integrate that to get high-resolution single-tissue annotations, and it's really fascinating what he finds. This is looking at 50 or 60 different tissues at annotations and looking where are these signals to parse apart where are the signals looking like they're coming from. And what we see here for Alzheimer's disease on the left and Parkinson's disease in the right is you'd expect to see lots of brain stuff, but we really don't. And what we do see is monocytes. And we're able to dig down into the monocyte signal from Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease and find pleiotropy there where the same genes, not the same variants in the genes, but the same loci appear to be involved with both conditions. So neurodegeneration may be married at the level of where on the monocyte active parts of the genome are we seeing genetic associations with these diseases. So there's going to be tons that we're going to learn from the genetic information on these conditions, and that's coming soon to journals near you, I hope. So McCann criteria from 84 has facilitated really very large genetic studies, and a careful look at early onset loci really doesn't reveal anything, or I say almost nothing, uh, related to late onset Alzheimer's disease. And biological network analyses don't seem to implicate amyloid processing, but what we do see is immune system being very important in late onset Alzheimer's disease. So I don't know if you noticed, when I first talked about the Dubois paper, this International Working Group criteria, I had part one up there, and that implied a part two, and here it is. So the other thing that they did was look at atypical Alzheimer's disease, and they point out there are conditions which have cerebral amyloidosis, where memory is not the most salient deficit, and they are primary progressive aphasia, posterior cortical atrophy, and frontal variant or disexecutive Alzheimer's disease, with language, visuospatial functioning, and executive functioning being the critical elements of each one. And this is a grant that I have called, that we call executive prominent Alzheimer's disease genetics and risk factors that's been very fun in looking at these conditions and looking at heterogeneity within people with late onset Alzheimer's disease. And this was the first paper we published, finding, looking at heritability of the difference between memory and executive functioning among people with Alzheimer's disease. Executive prominent Alzheimer's disease or frontal variant is recognized as an Alzheimer's subtype. Dickerson and Wolk in 2011 did some very nice work and noted that the difference between memory and executive functioning scores leads to isolating people with prominent uh, relative executive functioning deficits at one end of the spectrum and people with a really bad memory impairment but pretty intact executive functioning at the other end of the spectrum. So you end up with a continuous variable that's a really lovely thing to put into a, a genetic analysis. And we did that and looked at the heritability by chromosome. And the first thing here is that our heritability estimate of this difference in scores was 68%. And remember that about half of the variability in Alzheimer's disease is genetic. So it may be that there are genes that determine whether or not you get Alzheimer's disease. And then given that you're going to get Alzheimer's disease, there may be genes that relate to what flavor of Alzheimer's disease you get. And the pattern of genes that we see here, the pattern of chromosomes, is very different from the pattern that we saw with Alzheimer's disease, chromosome 19 here is where um, APOE is, and we find a lot of big signals that are nowhere near chromosome 19, incidentally also not at chromosome 21 or chromosome 1 or where uh, presenilin was either. So much to be learned about the heritability of this condition, and most recently we've been extending this to multiple domains with the idea that executive functioning and memory aren't the only things going on. There's also PPA and PCA, and God knows we need more three-letter acronyms or TLAs to help us understand everything. So this conceptual framework here is that there's these known subtypes, each characterized by a substantial relative deficit in one domain, and the idea that a pattern of deficits approach has characterized neuropsychology from the outset of that field. This is our work with the language domain and ACT. So on the rectangles here, we have each of the tests that's used in our dementia battery. So to determine whether a person has dementia and then what flavor of dementia it is. There's important details going on here that's where we spend a lot of our time trying to model these things in an appropriate way to the data. And then loadings on this primary language thing, and that's the thing we care about, the scores that we use over here. And we did the same thing for memory executive functioning and visual spatial functioning. And this is how it works at the individual level. So we get a score for memory, visual spatial functioning, language executive functioning, and this is this person's scores. 
we find the average of those scores for that person. So this person, at the time they were diagnosed with dementia, had a score of negative 0.08 on average across these domains. And we just take the numerical difference of each domain score from their individual average score, and we note that this person's got an isolated language impairment that's sticking out way below every other domain for this person. And it's a rare thing, but in the ACT study now, with our more than 1,000 dementia cases, we had one person with primary progressive aphasia. And this worked beautifully to isolate this isolated language impairment. And this person had a memory score that was pretty intact, and that's why they weren't diagnosed with having Alzheimer's disease at the time they were diagnosed with dementia. So this person isn't included in the analyses of Alzheimer's disease that I'll be talking about, but the same procedures very nicely are able to detect this person with this rare condition. And you can probably guess what's going to happen next. Here's person number two. Here's their average scores. One important point here is that this person's average scores are quite a bit more intact than the other person. So this is a within-person comparison, and I think that's critical. I don't rely on external standards, external thresholds. You end up with a whole world of hurt if you do that. The within-person comparison is just much more understandable and much more comprehensible, and I think we're the first really to introduce that in a big way to the field. I think that's, it's a subtle thing, but it's really important, I think. And here we have this person's deficits and sticking out below there is a visual spatial functioning. This person had likewise one person in our thousand had this rare condition of primary cortical or posterior cortical degeneration, posterior cortical atrophy, and their isolated uh, visual spatial functioning is sticking out right there. Before I saw these, we had picked negative 0.65 as our threshold, our, our single value to choose. And it very nicely, this person also has a fairly prominent executive functioning problem, um, but their visual spatial functioning is even more impressive. So we did the same approach among people diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease in the ACT study. And I'm gonna build this table in the next several slides. So the first thing to note is that about half the people had all of their domains relatively similar uh, at 48% with no domain. There were 148 with an isolated memory impairment, 18% of our group, 13% with isolated visual spatial, and then you can see the other numbers there. No differences in sex across these groups. Intriguingly, no difference in age. These rare things are described as having early onset. And so one hypothesis would be that th what we're seeing is some weird early onset thing that's barely able to get into the ACT study, but not at all. What we're seeing is, in fact, variants of late onset Alzheimer's disease with a mean diagnosis age in the upper 80s, which is where the people are from those earlier graphs from the Alzheimer's Association. And no differences in education. Intriguingly important differences in APOE where the group with isolated memory impairment have a more than twofold difference, more than twofold increased risk of having APOE epsilon 4 alleles. The cognition scores, I'm not going to have time to ex uh, explore in detail, but mostly what we see is that the average scores seem fairly similar across these groups and that our scoring worked great to isolate about a one standard deviation difference in each of these domains and the groups that, had, uh, that were assigned to each of those domains. Neuropathology-wise, what I've done here is I've got everybody with Alzheimer's disease here in this yellow group compared to cognitively normal elderly controls. And you can think of the Sonnen paper here. This is now a lar much larger group. We haven't eliminated that bottom 20%, but similar idea where there's a lot of neuropathology, not zero in any of these things for any of these findings. There's more in the dementia group, in the Alzheimer's disease group. We, I've eliminated people here who had other non-AD forms of dementia from this table. So in this group, there's more, but not like 100% more in any of these things. Uh, this is the people who had no prominent domain, and they looked pretty similar to the everybody group, and that's because they're half of them. The red and blue coding here is for differences that are more than 10% from everybody. So the memory group has more people with a high Brock stage more people with more amyloid angiopathy, and that's going to become important in a little bit. Um, so they're sticking out as having more Alzheimer's pathology than everybody else, and these groups have less Alzheimer's pathology and perhaps more vascular pathology. These groups are small because we're subdividing the subset of people from our study who've come to autopsy who had Alzheimer's disease. When you start to slice up the pie, you get into pretty small numbers. Really intriguingly, then, is the genetic data and this is confusing and there's a lot going on. These are the results from the Lambert study, the IGAP study with the second massive number of authors slide. 
These are the genes on the left and the minor allele frequency in the second column and the odds ratios from that report. So these are the, the strength of relationship for each of these loci with Alzheimer's disease risk. You don't see any twos or threes or one and a half even. Our biggest is 1.3, and that one's a little iffy because it's a rare minor allele at only 4%. Um, I've, I've flipped some of these, the ones with asterisks, so that they're all in the risk direction, and that's going to help my color coding in a minute. This is the results from ACT overall, treating everybody with Alzheimer's disease as if they were the same. And what we find here is that it looks a lot like the Lambert paper. So we're seeing the same thing everybody else is. There's some variability uh, locus by locus. The group with no prominent domain looks a lot like everybody else. Again, this is about half of our group. This was fascinating though. The memory group is sticking out with much higher associations with Alzheimer's related SNPs. And here the red is increasingly risky with the color intensity reflecting the magnitude of the association. So much more, there are seven of these that are prominently red, and the chances of that happening by chance alone are very, very small. And the visual spatial group has some in both directions where it's really quite heterogeneous. We're finding a lot of differences across these subgroups in something that we thought was one genetic condition, but may reflect multiple. And this is true for the other smaller subgroups as well. A lot of colors that aren't all red in this graph, in this table. With cognitively defined subgroups, we think we'll be able to isolate people with higher proportions of APOE epsilon-4 alleles, higher degrees of Alzheimer's pathology, more AD risk alleles, and the people with isolated memory impairment are only 18% of those with Alzheimer's disease, hiding among the weeds of everybody else who has maybe a variety of other conditions. And this cognitively defined subgroups may provide a way to study the heterogeneity among people with Alzheimer's disease, and that's one of the things I'll be looking at in the coming years. So returning to our research milestones here, anti-amyloid uh, randomized controlled trials has been where the field is. And this is a paper from this summer that I had five or six people say, hey, did you see this new thing in nature? And boy, this looks exciting if you're that kid in the back of the auditorium in Stockholm and you're saying, oh my goodness, one year later, the people at six and 10 milligrams, it looks like their amyloid has melted away. That's awesome, right? And it's in nature, so it must be important, right? So the thing is, and in the paper, they talk about toxicity. They talk about, hey, there should be a column for the 30 milligram dose, but our, our data safety monitoring board refused to allow us to go up to 30 because of the toxicity. Dose limiting and drug experience limiting toxicity, where 31% of the people at this top dose had to discontinue treatment because of toxicity. And the common adverse events, they made up a new acronym amyloid-related re imaging abnormality so that you can see stuff on the MRI that's going on. And what's going on is I talked to you about amyloid angiopathy. So amyloid isn't just in plaques. Amyloid is also in the walls of your blood vessels as you get old, especially for people who have plaques. And animal models don't have amyloid angiopathy. And if you throw in a, an antibody into your bloodstream, it's gonna attack the first thing that it sees and that's gonna be the vessel wall. And so people get leaky vessel walls and it's a really bad idea for really old people to have leaky vessel walls. And the first place you see it is on the MRI. And so in this study, they had to do MRIs at baseline, week six, 18, 30, 42, and 54, in addition to the $5,200 amyloid PET scan to see whether they were getting any effect at all. This is an incredibly technical and a very technology-driven intervention that's very toxic, and we don't know if it has an effect on outcomes that people care about. So maybe we can vacuum away amyloid in the brain. Our data on genetics doesn't necessarily suggest that amyloid is really involved in the causative pathway for people with late-onset Alzheimer's disease. So maybe we'll be able to do this, but we don't know if it will have any real effect. And I've read the paper carefully, there's a lot of different cognitive outcomes that they don't report because they didn't see anything there. And I think that it's way too early to conclude that this is a good idea. And the other thing I would say is that elderly have been extremely underrepresented in randomized control trials. And this is really a failure of our, of our thinking about what's actually happening. And you think about to that, that pie chart that shows it's really in the old people that the problem is, and that's not the people who are in trials. This group of people under age 65 are highly overrepresented in trials. And then the young old from 65 to 74, and we know why that is, right? The oldest old 
have many comorbidities and they're sick and they're accumulating a lot of different things and it's complicated. But that's where the problem is, is in complicated real people, not in young people who have a pristino single thing that's going wrong with them. I encourage every young person that I can find to say, without laughing, I am an Alzheimer's researcher. And the reason is that the, the world is freaking out about this condition. Specifically, the United States is freaking out about this condition. There's very few things in politics where people agree. Alzheimer's research is one of them. There's been hundreds of millions of dollars of investment that's annual, adding to the annual budget of the NIA for Alzheimer's research. And one of the ways that's reflected is in pay lines. So if you have a non-Alzheimer's related, non-early stage investigator, et cetera, standard R01, you need to hit the 11th percentile, which is better than it's been over my career. I remember the 7th percentile. I remember the 8th percentile. 11 is, is better than that. It's not very good. If you have the same grant and it's related to Alzheimer's disease, you have to hit the 22nd percentile. Even if you're a large budget grant and you're related to Alzheimer's disease, the 19th percentile. There were 26 different funding opportunity announcements a week ago with set aside funds for Alzheimer's research. There is a tremendous amount of research investment in Alzheimer's disease that's either already happened or about to launch. And we're really well situated here to take good advantage of that. I've had the great privilege to work with so many people, way too many to try to enumerate any of them in this setting. And I've listed several of the most important of them here. I'm sure I've left people off which I'm very sorry about. But it's been a, a tremendous honor and a privilege to work with such wonderful colleagues here and around the country and around the world to tackle really important questions in Alzheimer's research. So thank you so much for your attention today and the opportunity to speak with you.